Hello, I'm Ed Moriarty, Director of Worldwide Marketing at TA Instruments. I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us in today's webinar. If you get disconnected at any time, please use the instructions you received to log back in. You can access various content by clicking the documents icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. This includes speaker bio and additional file downloads. If you need help at any time, click the question mark icon. Please ask any questions you may have at any time during the presentation by submitting them through the Q&A window. We will answer as many as possible at the end of the webinar. Our presenter today is Dr. Malin Serkusk. For the last 10 years, Malin has held the position of Product Manager and Application Specialist at TA Instruments. She holds a Master of Science degree in Biochemistry from the University of Stockholm and a PhD from the University of Lund in the laboratory of Professor Ingomar Wadzo. She has worked extensively with differential scanning calorimetry and isothermal titration calorimetry, as well as other biophysical methods. Her early work in microcalorimetry instrument development included responsibilities in product management, application lab management, and marketing at Thermometric in Sweden. She's considered the world's leading expert on TAM isothermal instruments with numerous microcalorimetry publications, and in 2014 was recognized for her contribution to the field of microcalorimetry and featured as a biophysicist and profiled by the Biophysical Society. The title of her webinar today is Stability Testing of Energetic Materials by Isothermal Microcalorimetry. Malin? Thank you. So this webinar will deal with stability measurement of energetic material studied by isothermal microcalorimetry. The webinar will be that first I give an introduction to general introduction to energetic materials, what you can find out about microcalorimetry. I will show you the instrument which we can measure this with and then I will give some general examples and focus on propellants by the end. Virtually all chemical and physical processes will give rise to a heat production or a heat consumption. This heat production or consumption can be measured by calorimetry directly. So it's a non-specific technique which makes it ideal to study most any kind of process. It can be biological, physical or chemical. Isothermal microcalorimetry is measured we measure heat production rate, or actually heat production is in the sample and what we measure is the heat flow out from the sample to the calorimeter. The heat production rate is denoted P and that's equal to the enthalpy of the reaction we are studying, the rate constant and a function of the concentration. We will plot the heat production or the heat flow from the sample as seen in the left graph where we see the heat flow on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So we can at any point during this follow the reaction rate as a function of time. If we integrate the heat production rate or the heat flow, heat production is is expressed in watts, which is joules per second. So we, if we integrate that, we get the total joule or the total heat that's evolved from the process. And we can follow the extent of the reaction, which we see in the right curve. Energetic materials, I will refer to materials that will, or substances or chemicals that will exhibit a rich for, r risk for self-decomposition. This degradation could result in self-heating of the substance uh, and subsequent runaway reaction. So it, because of this it's important to secure the safety in handling of the substance for uh, manufacturing, storage and transportation. Examples of unstable uh, substances are propellants, percarbonates and peroxides and I will talk about the percarbonates and propellants during this talk. As if the rate of heat production exceeds the rate of heat exchange to the surroundings, the temperature of the sample of this or the substance will increase. 
As a result of this, with the temperature increase, the composition rate will increase, and ultimately it can be a risk of a runaway reaction with risk for explosion and personal injury. This graph shows a simple model for self-heating. We see the heat production is in the red graph, and at all times the heat production rate from a sample needs to be below the heat loss graph that is blue in this curve. At a certain point, we get to the critical heat production rate at the critical temperature, and there the reaction can take off in a thermal runaway reaction. So it's needed to make sure that we always stay in the safe range of an energetic substance. This is a general equation for self-heating substances where you can relate the heat production at different temperatures. So you can measure at some temperature and you can relate back to other temperature like storage temperature, uh, for example. The heat production rate at certain temperature and certain degree of um, conversion of your substance. Uh, so the heat production rate is a function of the temperature and the degree of conversion. And that could be expressed as the heat production rate as a reference temperature, a function of how the material is consumed or degraded times the Arrhenius relationship where we can see the um, temperature dependence of the uh, rate constant. This could be measured at different temperatures. So with microcalorimetry, we will directly measure the critical parameter, the heat production rate. We can also measure the degree of conversion or the extent of the reaction. We can measure the activation energy by doing this measurement at different temperatures. And all of those are in that equation for self-heating substances. But we can also measure the heat capacity, which is also an important factor to take into consideration to see how much heat is stored in the material as well. <clears throat> so what we see, what we can measure, we can, as shown before, we can directly measure the heat production rate. At any time, we will see how the reaction uh, rate varies over time. For the degree of conversions, there are several ways of doing that. We need the total energy for the whole reaction. So either you let the reaction go to completion to get the enthalpy of the total reaction, and then you can measure the heat produced at any time and take the ratio for the heat produced to the, the total heat of reaction. It is also possible to run the substance in a DSC where you get the total degradation at much higher temperatures, but you can get the enthalpy or a correlated enthalpy that you can use uh, for that uh, total heat from that reaction. Another way of doing degree of conversion is to fit your data uh, to a kinetic model. So by modeling the data, you can calculate the enthalpy of the reaction. This table is just showing that if you have a certain reaction scheme, it fits to a certain um, rate equation and they are modified to fit calorimetric data. So you will fit that data and you will get the enthalpy of that reaction. What you can also get here, you will get the rate constant which then can be used in the Arrhenius relationship also from this. So you can determine the activation energy in three different ways. The first way is then a kinetic model where you get the rate constant from fitting your data to this model. So just an example here on a first order reaction, which will have an exponential solution. So if you plot the logarithmic of the heat production that you are measuring from the calorimeter versus the temperature, for a first order reaction, you will get a straight line. From this straight line, you get the slope, and the slope is then um, the rate constant of this reaction. From the intercept, you will also get the enthalpy of the reaction to be used then for the degree of conversion equation. This rate constant, well, you will measure it at different temperatures, so you can plot it in an Arrhenius relationship. So you plot the rate constant, the logarithmic of the rate constant to the inverse of the absolute temperature, and you can calculate the Arrhenius, and, um, and Arrhenius uh, relationship, the activation energy out of that. 
Another way to determine the activation energy is by looking at the extent of the reaction. In many cases, the reactions are very complex, so you can't fit it to one model. There are a lot of different reactions going on uh, after each other. And then you can use the extent of the reaction to calculate uh, the, the activation energy. So what you would do, you would measure the heat flow at different temperature, as in the upper left graph. Um, and then you will integrate it to get the extent of the reaction, and that's in the lower left graph. In the lower left graph, you will see at which extent of the reaction you want to compare your data. So for example, when it's evolved 120 joules, you will go in in the lower left graph, take 120 joules, see what time that occur, and then you will go to the upper graph and go in and see what the heat flow is at that corresponding um, extent of the reaction. This uh, heat flow at this time is then plotted in an Arrhenius um, relationship with the logarithm of the heat flow versus the inverse of the temperature and you get uh, <coughs> a line that will ex uh, give you the activation energy. What is seen in this kind of complex uh, relations is that you get a lot of different activation energy depending on the extent of the reaction. So in the upper right graph you have the different extent of the reactions, different curves, and if you look at the slope of that which gives you the activation energy you will see you get the different activation energies depending on the extent of the reaction, and that's shown in the lower right graph. And then there is a third way to determine the activation energy, and that's called the step method. Then you will put your sample in at one temperature, and then you will change the temperature of the instrument while the sample is in. So you start at one temperature, and you go up and down in temperature, and you will measure the relative heat flow at the changing of temperature. So in this case, they have cycled the temperature between 40, 30, 50, and back to 40 degrees again. It looks a little strange in this graph that <clears throat> the heat flow at 30 looks higher than at 40, but it's because it's measured in an earlier version of the instrument where you need to magnify the signal uh, by amplification. So it's a 10 times amplification on that graph. You will read the heat flow at the change. You will extrapolate the lines so they match each other between the different temperatures. And then you will take this temperature and will calculate the relative heat flow between the different uh, temperature steps. So what you do is set the starting temperature to 1 by definition, and then you will take the relative heat flow at the different times. This relative heat flow uh, will be plotted logarithmic logarithmically in also an Arrhenius relationship and calculate activation energy. This activation energy can then be used to calculate the rate constant at an, another temperature as well, which is not measured at. Then I measured you can measure the heat capacity as well, and that's also done in the TAM by insert in an empty ampule first at a certain temperature, and then you would change the temperature while the sample is in the calorimeter, and you will measure the heat associated flowing in or out of that ampule. And then you go back to the, uh, the starting temperature, you will load your sample in and do the same temperature step. You will take the difference in the energy between the empty ampule and the one with the sample, and you divide it by the sample weight, and then you can get the heat capacity of that uh, sample material. For best result or most accurate result, you should include a calibration of a known substance, for example, sapphire, and then you will be able to do heat capacity measurements close to a few percent of a few tenths of a percent of accuracy. So how would we do that? We have an instrument, TAM4, thermal activity monitor, it's the fourth generation, it's a multi-channel uh, microcalorimeter system that could be equipped with one up to 48 individual and independent calorimeters. The only thing in common they will have is the temperature as they will sit in the same thermostat. You can choose different calorimeters with different sensitivity depending on the needs, and you can measure small samples up to very big samples depending on your sample needs.
So it's one system, it has multiple possibilities. There are two versions of the thermostat. One with four positions, we could host up to four different or, or the same calorimeter models. And then there is a special version that's seen in the top picture where you can have up to 48 independent calorimeters. They will then be of the same time, but you will type, but you will get high throughput of, of the samples through the measurement cycles. So I mentioned it's a modular system. So you start with the thermostat, and most common then is the four position, which you will equip with different type of calorimeters depending on your need. The sample is held in different sample handling systems. Shown in the picture here are closed ampules. And then if there is any modif manipulation to the sample needed, you will use an accessory, different accessories like mass flow controllers, uh, pumps to be able to control, for example, the atmosphere over the sample. The different calorimeters you can use is highly sensitive, 4 milliliter and 20 milliliter calorimeters where you can optimize the system completely. For more routine measurements, you can use the mini calorimeter or the multi calorimeter that's seen in the middle of the plot. Uh, the mini calorimeter we use for routine measurements are also used for the TAM48 channel, then it's only that type of calorimeter and you use up to 4 milliliter sample sizes. Uh, these mini calorimeters can also be arranged in a cluster, so you have six calorimeters that will occupy one position in the four position TAM4 thermostat. They are also, these calorimeters, available in 20 milliliter size, so you can get bigger samples into the calorimeter. If you have even bigger samples or assembly of samples, we have something we call the macro calorimeter where you can have up to 125 milliliter samples. So these are the heat flow calorimeters of the TAM4 that can be used for energetic material testing. There are different sample handling systems, as you m I mentioned. There are two types. One are what we call statics or closed ampules, where you do m no manipulation of the samples. They are most commonly used for stability testing of energetic materials, the disposable glass ampules of three or four milliliter sizes. But we do also uh, have the possibility to use open system, where you can actually manipulate the sample over the course of the measurements. Uh, for example, you can change the atmosphere from oxygen to nitrogen, or you can change the relative humidity over the sample. It's also possible to measure pressure buildup inside an ampule at the same time as you measure the heat flow from a sample. So now I will give some general examples before I continue to, to percarbonates and propellants. Scanning calorimetry, or DSC, is a very go good complementary tool to isothermal microcalorimetry. So the TAM mainly measures isothermally. But if you will have a DSC at the same time and will measure data as seen in the upper two curves, that's DSC data, and in the lower curve you have heat flow data from an isothermal calorimeter. So if you have a system, A goes to B, and you run that in a DSC, you will see at higher temperature, you can see an exothermic reaction or exothermic peak, for example. And if you rerun it, you will not see that because the reaction has already happened. That's a kinetic system. It's an unstable system. Such a system will have a very low energy barrier for the A go to B. If this is the case, you will be able to take a lower temperature as denoted T1 in the graph, and you can put the sample into the microcalorimeter at this temperature and follow the reaction over time as you see in the lower graph. You will see that the line could be completely flat, but it's offset from zero, which means that we have a small, slow reaction going on continuously at lower temperature. So if you run and get an ex, ex, say exothermic, a graph in the DSC, you will know that you can most likely detect this reaction at lower temperatures in an isothermal calorimeter. However, if you would run a sample in the DSC that will give you an endothermic peak, 
this is a, a thermodynamic stable system and if you would run this at lower temperature in an isothermal calorimeter you wouldn't see anything because this is a reversible reaction you will get the peak back um, and you can compare that with the melt it's completely stable at lower temperature but you need to reach that melting temperature before the reaction actually happens so this is an example with looking at nitrocellulose in a toluene. It was run in a DSC. We can see the decomposition peak coming at two, over 200 degrees C. This sample was then run in an isothermal calorimeter at 70 degrees, and we can see that it's revealing an autocatalytic behavior, but just keeping it isothermal at 70 degrees. So after 10 hours, you will see the reaction uh, is taking off and you will see the autocatalytic behavior of this reaction at much lower temperature which will give indications on storage conditions for example. And here is another example of add, um, looking at an energetic plasticizer that will decompose quickly by itself. This measurement is done at 65 degrees, so it's accelerated conditions. And then it's tested by adding 1% of normal propellant stabilizers to see if we can stabilize uh, this energetic plasticizer NPN. Very many of these uh, stabilizers will not have an effect. You can see there is no difference for with, with or without a stabilizer. One stabilizer central light, one will show an ex, uh, we'll say autocatalytic behavior after one day, and the uh, two NPA will uh, show stability at least for two days at uh, 65 degrees. So this is a quick way of looking at if it has an effect or not by additives to, to an energetic substance. I mentioned we can change the atmosphere over a sample and in this case we can see that this is used the perfusion ampule where you can continuously flow a gas over the sample during the measurement. So we will have your sample in the bottom of this long uh, ampule that you see on the left in the graph. Uh, and you continuously flow the gas with a constant flow rate over the sample. In this case, there were two measurements done. One was flowing oxygen over uh, a polymer film, and the other one was flowing nitrogen over this polymer film. We can see the oxygen sample. We can see a high heat flow from this sample, where the nitrogen ap uh, shows approximately nothing. After a couple of days, the gas was switched between these two measurements, and we can see the one that had oxygen now got nitrogen goes down, so the reaction rate goes down, so we can conclude it was clearly an oxidation reaction that needed oxygen to happen. And on the nitrogen sample that got oxygen, we can see that the reaction really takes off and gets to a high value. So oxygen will be needed for this, this reaction. And it's a simple way to test if oxygen or not is involved in the tests. Another example is to be able to change the relative humidity with the uh, RH perfusion ampule. Here we control two gas flows, one with um, a completely dry gas going in and one that we are hu humidifying to 100% relative humidity. And then we will mix the gases over the sample so we get the the relative humidity we want to have over the sample to be able to see what's happened when the sample is exposed to humidity. In this case we can see that the reaction rate is going up when the relative humidity goes up. So in the first part you have 40% relative humidity, we can see there is a reaction happening. Increasing it to 70% relative humidity, the reaction rate will increase. Humidity is needed for this reaction. And going back to 0% relative humidity, the reaction goes down to zero. So water molecule is needed for this reaction, which can be demonstrated in this way. Now I give an example on how to measure percarbonates. Sodium percarbonate is uh, a bleaching agent that's used in detergents and it's um, produced in large quantities around the world. Sodium percarbonate will contain sodium um, 
hydrogen peroxide, and hydrogen peroxide will uh, decompose spontaneously to form water and oxygen. And in the presence of humidity, this reaction rate will also go up, uh, and tr metal traces or any impurities can also affect the stability. So shipping and storage of sodium percarbonate is associated with risk of getting self-heating and maybe runaway reactions. So it's very important to control uh, and predict the safe conditions for handling of sodium percarbonate. And that could be that heat production data can be gained from microcalorimetry. Today, they test sodium percarbonates by putting them in a closed ampule at 40 degrees in a microcalorimeter and watch the heat flow for up to 48 hours. The heat flow data is taken at 16 and 48 hours and fed into models that will simulate the temperature evolution in time and space in a storage container. So the heat production rate needs to be below a certain value at this time to be considered safe for shipping and storing. I mentioned that sodium percarbonate will also give off oxygen, which means that the pressure in a closed ampule will also increase, so we can measure both the pressure and the heat flow evaluation in uh, a TAM by use of the um, pressure ampule. We call it the vacuum pressure ampule, so you can also use it for study processes under vacuum. So in this picture, you have the 20 milliliter vacuum pressure ampule. You will put the sample in the lower ampule in the bottom, and on the top you have a pressure transducer. You also have it connected to the vacuum pump and a pressure release valve. It says to set to release pressure once it reaches um, up to 10 bars to release the overpressure that's produced. The whole pressure ampule is inserted into the TAM calorimeter as seen in the picture to the, uh, it sits in the calorimeter in the upper right position. Now the example I show is to show a 200 milligram uh, sodium percarbonate that was put in a 4 milliliter pressure ampule and follow to it goes to completion. Temperature was set to 50 degrees and for the, for the reaction to go to completion it takes seven days so that's the scale on the x-axis. The red curve here is the heat flow curve where we can follow the reaction rate over time. The blue curve is the pressure data, and we can see that the pressure has increased by 3.7 bars over this uh, seven days the reaction proceeds. Also calculating from how much sample you have and how much oxygen that will be produced, this pressure increase correlates well with how much gas that will be evolved from this reaction. So I said if you integrate the whole curve, you can follow the extent of the reaction on where in the reaction you are. So in this plot, a blue curve, uh, there is a blue and a red curve, they are overlapping each other. The blue curve is the total heat that has evolved during this reaction of the composition of the sodium percarbonate, and the red curve is the pressure that's uh, build up during the course of the decomposition. We can see that both these curves overlap each other almost completely, which shows that both pressure and heat is an indicator of the extent of the reaction in a similar way as they follow one each other completely. And now we will move to propellants testing. Propellants belong to a group of materials that's termed low explosives, but they are chemically and otherwise energetically unstable and they will spontaneously decompose during storage. To minimize this decomposition, stabilizers are added to increase storage life and for safety. So the Exponential increase of the decomposition rate due to self-heating is caused by the heat formation or the temperature in increase in a sample due to the exothermic decomposition reactions. Unlimited heat losses to the surroundings and also there will be formation of uh, reactive decomposition products like nitrogen uh, oxide. <coughs> 
But the critical parameter to determine the decomposition of a propellant is the heat flow, heat production, rate of heat production, and that's measured in uh, the microcalorimeter. So applications of TAM for looking at propellants or other energetic materials were, were, would be to predict runaway reactions, to study temperature dependence of the overall decomposition of any uh, chemically unstable propellant and other, um, other materials. It's used for predict safe storage conditions. You can look at which temperature can be used, which humidity that could be used. It's used for surveillance testings of propellants, see how long service life they will have after storage. Looking at compatibility of propellants, interaction between propellants and whatever they are uh, hold within. Look at service life of new propellants type and also all kind of data that's necessary to, to take into consideration for safe handling of uh, propellants. There are some prope propellant testing standards. There is one Stanag standard 4582, which will uh, describe standardized test of uh, heat flow from a propellant that's held at elevated temperatures during a specified time to be able to predict how long they are safe to store at 25 degrees uh, over periods of time. There is another standard, Stanag 4147, that will look at chemical compatibility between ammunition components and the propellants. And then there are uh, vacuum thermal stability tests or modified vacuum thermal stability tests that will see how much gas evolution it comes from a propellant over 48 hours. That in itself is not the microcalorimetric standard or method, but with a combination of the vacuum uh, pressure ampules, you com combine this method with the heat flow measurement to gain even more information, safety information of the propellant. Oops. So the NATO standard, Stanag 4582, it's dedicated testing program for nitrate nitrate ester-based propellants by use of heat flow calorimetry. It's a method to establish the chemical stability of single base, double base, or triple base the, um, propellants for that it should be safe to store for 10 years, uh, a minimum of 10 years when stored at 25 degrees. And this method is equally applicable to propellants that actually have had stabilizers added to themselves. In the graph, we can see that in the upper uh, x-axis, we have qualification time and that's in years, so that's the corresponding years uh, store at, that it could be stored at 25 degrees, that corresponds to test temperature uh, testing at 70 degrees, so the observation time in days at 70 degrees for 10 days would correspond to uh, a storage time uh, for 3 days at 25 degrees. So this curve, upper curve here, will show a stability or a heat flow measurement of a double base propellant uh, measured at 89 degrees. Um, and you can see the characteristic profile of that. So it's stored for four days and that will indicate that it's safe to store for uh, 10 years at 25 degrees. In the bottom, you can see that's a Arrhenius relationship for these kind of propellants. And you can see there is a kink in the curve. So actually, the activation energy is different uh, and it changes between 50 and 60 degrees. So for calculating back, it's needed to use two different activation energies if you're going to extrapolate data that's done at 90 degrees down to 25 degrees. So in the Stanag, it describes that 80 kilo per mole uh, below 60 degrees and an activation energy of 120 kilo per mole uh, above 60 degrees will be conservative enough to be able to extrapolate down to 25 degrees to be on the safe side uh, for these extrapolations. So to determine how long time you need to test the sample in the microcalorimeter, uh, to correspond to that time at 25 uh, degrees, you need to use this extrapolation reaction where you use these different activation energies 
and then you know you can calculate from 10 years at 25 degrees how long time you need to test it at whatever measuring temperature you choose to measure your sample at. You have to calculate how long this test will be. And this is done already in the Stanag method, so it's tabulated value for each temperature between 60 and 90 degrees. You will also need to determine how much is the maximum heat flow that can come from this sample uh, to be, say that it's actually stored, uh, safe to store it, so it doesn't produce too much heat during the time. So they have calculated with worst case scenarios. So um, if you will have a well insulated cartridge of a certain diameter and a max storage temperature of 71 degrees, that would be the maximum, what comes, the heat flow that comes from that will be the maximum limit that you can actually handle and still have um, uh, heat loss to the surrounding to avoid this runaway reaction. Or this is equal to storage propellant in a bulk at 50 degrees. By using the heat transport model, uh, we can calculate the heat flow uh, that's at that measuring temperature, which is the maximum temp uh, heat production you can have at that uh, measuring temperature to correspond to this worst case scenario. So that's used. This is also already done in the Stanag method. But then if you have done this measurement, you know how long you will test it, you know which is the maximum uh, energy heat production you can have from the sample, and then you say it's safe to store at 25 degrees for 10 years. However, the storage temperature may not always be exactly 25 degrees over this period. So you need to calculate also on the temperature variation. If the climate is changing and you have 40 degrees in the summer and 15 degrees in the, the winter, you need to calculate how long time the propellant is actually exposed to this different temperature and use the same relationship uh, to be able to calculate how long times you use it actually corresponds to with a varying temperature. So, to conclude, you have now the tabulated data uh, of the measuring time and the acceptance criteria in this table. So say you want to test at 60 degrees, which is the lower uh, temperature range in the standing method. Then you need to measure your sample in the microcalorimeter for 123 days, which is quite long. And the heat flow, heat production from the sample should not exceed 9.8 uh, microwatt per gram of sample. But if you increase the temperature to 90 degrees and measure there, you only need to measure for 3.43 days uh, to qualify your propellant at 25 degrees. Then the heat flow value shouldn't exceed 350 microgram per gram of propellant. So anywhere there you can choose which type of temperature you want to choose at, but to save time it's usually better to go higher temperature unless there is a safety issue in going too high in temperature. So how would you do the measurements? As far as possible the propellant should be tested in its original condition. So as soon as you are if you can fit the propellant into this ampule, we have three and four milliliter ampule, they should be put into as they are into this ampule. And the sample you take should be representative of the lot of propellant that should be tested. <clears throat> and if the propellant is too big to fit into this ampule, you can grind it or uh, cut it into pieces, but the pieces you put into the ampule need to be as close as possible in size when you put it into the ampules. And also the heat flow from the propellant will depend somewhat on the moisture content, so it's advisable to also uh, test uh, how much moisture it's in the sample, and sample that's in test should not be preconditioned prior to the test, they should be tested as is. So the sample ampules should be filled up with the propellant. There should be minimal of air inside the ampule for test. So the loading density would be between 0.8 to 1.1 gram per milliliter of sample. Sometimes for safety reasons, you can't fill so much like you fill an ampule, four milliliter ampule completely with propellant. You can go to a three milliliter ampule to have less sample, but if that's also too much, you have to fill up this, this 
the area or the volume inside the ampule with an inert uh, material like a glass rod for example so you will actually you really need to minimize the sample volume inside the ampule uh, air volume inside the sample also, if an ammunition that you're going to test have a certain loading density, it's also okay according to the method to load the ampule with the loading density of the actual product you are testing. And then when we come to the measurement, I say you should do it between 60 and 90 degrees. And to save time, you usually go to the upper ends of this temperature range to be able to measure. And it's recommended to perform the measurement at least in duplicate. Sometimes there are gas evolution and it will uh, release gas in the calorimeter and you will get endothermic peaks while the gas is released. Those measurements need to be discarded as well. If you are not interested in qualifying for 10 years at 25, if you have an already qualified propellant, you can use the same method for surveillance testing and then you can minimize the test time with up to 30%. The data evolution, evaluation is done by normalizing the propellant to, to mass, so you have microwatt per gram, and then you won't start evaluation until you have reached 5 joules per gram, that evolution of heat, so you will start your evaluation at 5 joules per gram up to the, the described testing time that's described by Stanag. During this time, you're not allowed to exceed a certain heat flow limit to be considered as a safe propellant. And you can see in the graph here, we can see a line at 0.8 days. That's where it reached 5 joules per gram. And then we have the maximum temperature limit of 3.43 days, which is the test time at 90 degrees. And then, during this time, it should be below 350 microwatts per gram. And you can see that all these graphs are within these limits that's on the plot. And you can say these are safe to store at 25 degrees for at least 10 years. If it goes outside these limits, it's not safe for this long time. And there are also some compatibility examples. Uh, microcalorimetry is a very good method to test compatibility between materials. What you would do is that you will test your different components uh, individually, and then you will make a mixture and test the mixture. So if you normalize your, if you calculate from the individual mixture, if you will mix them, or say, if you calculate from your individual measurements of your individual components and you calculate the theoretical curve how much heat flow it will be if you mix them uh, in different proportions how much that should be and if you measure uh, the same mixture and you get an you don't get overlapping curve from the theoretical to the measured there is something interaction some interactions between the samples um, and then you need to find out what's uh, going on with them. But there is something reaction uh, between the two samples. The Stanag for, uh, sorry, I back. This measurement is done by heat flow. So you compare the heat flow data of different uh, measurements and you check how the heat flow is overlapping or not over time. The Stanag 4147 will actually measure, compare the integrated heat over a certain time. So it takes the total reaction heat uh, and compare that for a defined test period. It could be, for example, six days at 85 degrees, we would do the compatibility testing. Or you can use the same time and temperature limits that's depicted, uh, described by Stanag 4582. Again, this is the same, but it's an illustrated picture of the same compatibility measurement I described precise. You have component A and component B. You measure them individually, and then you calculate the theoretical curve, how you will expect if there is no interaction between the A and B. But if you get like the green curve A and B measured, like the green full plot curve, you will say there is something happening between the samples. This 
uh, measurement could be done like you just have the dry powders A, B and mix them. But it's also possible to have gas phase interaction compatibility and interaction zone. Or you can have intimate exposure that you actually have a solvent to get the molecules closer together when you're studying this type of compatibility measurements. So here's one example with a loctite, an uncured loctite and a single base propellant. So in curve A, you have the pure propellant measured. In B, you put your uncured loctite. Uh, this has access to oxygen and the oxygen will actually inhibit the curing reaction. So you have a curing reaction, but it goes very slowly. And then you calculate in C the non-interaction curve, which you will see, and it will be quite a low amount of heat. In this case, it's not a 50-50 mixture. You have 60 for 84 weight percent mixture, so you will calculate with dif different uh, ratios as well. But if you measure this system, you get a curve D, and you see you get a huge peak in the beginning. And if you just look at this, you will say they, these are not compatible. Then it's also important to see that what is causing this reaction. In this case, it turns out to be that the uncured loctite will be going into the pores of the propellants where it's shielded from oxygen. So we actually see a very fast curing reaction of the loctite going into the propellant. And then there will be some absorption uh, of the loctite to the propellant. And this could be calculated how much that absorption enthalpy is. So actually, you can see that curve C uh, which is the calculated graph, and the D, after all the curing and absorption has happened, they will actually go back to the same uh, level. So here could be a discussion, are they really incompatible, or is actually just a reaction uh, of the loctite curing that you are seeing uh, in an earlier, in a different way than if the loctite is by itself. In the next example, we have a polyamide uh, mixed with a single base propellant. So in curve A you have the propellant, in curve B you have the polyamide, and in the C curve uh, you will see the calculated non-interaction curve. Uh, but when you actually do the measurements, which is in curve D, you see you have a quite a lot of heat flow that goes on in excess to your reaction, and this actually proceeds for a very long day, uh, time. I, in the curve you can see this is measured for over 100 hours. So you can see there's a long-term reaction and this is really a non-compatible sample because they are interacting, interacting over time with each other. So to conclude, the power of microcalorimetry, the power of TAM to measure on energetic material. So the rate of heat production is the critical parameter for stability testing of energetic materials, and TAM will directly measure this rate of heat production. You will only need small quantities of samples, and the same samples is used throughout the measurements, and stability data is obtained continuously. With the multi-channel capacity of the TAM, you can run many samples simultaneously. And the results you get can be, be used to predict runaway re reactions and also to determine safe storage conditions. The rate of heat production of an energetic sample will be studied under safe conditions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Malin, for that very informative presentation. I see that we have a, a number of questions, so why don't we start, um, start at the top. Uh, the first question that we have for you, Malin, is does the TAM data provide insight into which model, A goes to B or A plus B goes to C, et cetera, that I should use, or do I need to know this already? Uh, well, TAM data will provide you insights to which type of uh, kinetic model uh, your data um, applies to or your, your system uh, follows. So the heat flow rate or the heat production rate that we're measuring in the TAM is related to the reaction rate uh, of 
your system you are studying. The shape of the curve can tell you something about the reaction scheme that your process is going through. Uh, we also do have different type of kinetic models that you can fit your heat flow data to. So it's always good to have an idea about your, your model of your, your system, but you can also have a, a good guess of your reaction and then you can actually try to fit it to different uh, kinetic models to see where if it fits to your theory. Um, and also by plotting the curves in different way, like if you do a, a plot of heat flow versus the total heat, um, if you get a straight line that, that will imply that you have a force first order kinetic reaction. Uh, if you want to evaluate or if you get a curv curved line, you may have a second order reaction. There is also possibility to set up different type of experiments where you vary the different components to see that if one component is a limiting factor or not, that could also tell you something about the reaction mechanism that you are studying. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, we have another question. Does the Arrhenius equation used for the activation energy determine work for all or most reaction types? Uh, for most uh, reaction types, it will. Um, and it's easy to test with a TAM. You can study your reaction uh, at many different temperatures. And then if you plot them in an Arrhenius relationship, you will see if they follow this relation. If there is a change in the curvature or if they don't fall on the same line, then it could be that you have different reaction mechanisms at, uh, at different temperatures, or that when you elevate the temperature, the water activity of your sample will be different and that will affect your reaction rate of the system. So that will also, that could affect your uh, Arrhenius relationship to not fit into this uh, properly, but there could be a reason to that. Or that the water content in the sample, the sample integrity can be different at different temperatures and that will be reflected uh, when you, you plot an Arrhenius relationship. Uh, you can test by making the water activity uh, equal at a different temperature by the use of microhydrostats that you can put into your ampule to keep the water activity constant uh, at the different temperatures you are testing. We can also see that the Stanag I described in the um, uh, webinar, the, the lecture, the Stanag 4582 actually has two different uh, activation energies in the temperature interval that we're studying. And it's possible to use different activation energies for the same type of models, uh, the systems we're studying. Okay, great. Okay, next question. Can I use organic solvents in the TAM? Yes, it's possible to use organic solvents in the TAM. Uh, what is needed to consider is which type of ampule you're using. So the material in the ampule is compatible with the solvent you are using. Also, the sealing, the O-ring material you are using needs to be compatible with that solvent. Uh, we do have different type of ampule materials, different type of O-ring materials. So that could be, be optimized for the system um, you are studying. A note is, though, that um, you need to be aware of if you're measuring at elevated temperature that you're not exceeding the boiling point of the solvent under study. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question. Does the TAM have any safeguards preventing runaway reactions? Yes, there are two different types of safeguards. One deals with the temperature. Um, you could, we have two different watchdogs for the temperature. If there is a runaway reaction starting in one of the calorimeters, there will be heating up uh, in the calorimeter, which can affect the temperature that is measured of the bath. We are not increasing the temperature of the thermostat, but the fluctuations in the thermostat temperature when it comes into the detecting unit of the thermostat, we see that the, the fluctuation of the temperature is increasing. And if that temperature fluctuation is increasing over a certain limit, 
we will shut the thermostat off and it will cool down to uh, to room temperature. And for each temp, uh, temp what do you say? Um, degree, it cools down the reaction rate of that potentially um, accelerated reaction will slow down. We do also have a temperature limit set. So if you forget an ampule inside the calorimeters and someone else changes the temperature, you can have set the uh, limit that the temperature of the thermostat cannot exceed a certain number, then it would sh shut itself off. So no one by mistake will set the temperature of the calorimeter to a higher temperature than is recommended for a certain type of samples. So that's the temperature uh, safeguards we have. There is also, a, if you run the STANAG samples with both evolve pressure and it will evolve heat. We also say that pressure evolution that is also related to much heat that is evolved during the measurements. And there is a safety limit of the total heat evolved from a sample. If it reaches a critical value, it will actually cool down the thermostat to room temperature. It will also send out warning, a, a signal that the sample has reached its critical level. So you don't risk to have uh, uh, runaway reactions in the instrument. Okay, another question on the instrument itself. How long a time can a reaction be followed in the TAM? In principle, it could be followed indefinitely. So you can be measuring for as long periods of time as it's practical to occupy an instrument. The STANAG actually, the STANAG 4582 that uses microcalorimetry actually defines the measuring time at 60 degrees to be 123 days. That's a four month long measurement and that's no problem to do that in the TAM. Uh, if for other type of applications, you want to measure very long periods of time. You can either do that in, in the TAM, but of course that occupies a lot of measuring capacity by doing this for long times. So it's also possible to use an external block heater. So measure a sample for a week, keeping at the same temperature at an external block heater for maybe one week, put it back into the calorimeter and measure, we can then fit kinetics data of all these connected pieces that are measured intermittently in the TAM as well. This is just to increase the measuring capacity. But in principle, you can use the same sample for a year if you would like to do that. Okay, all right. And uh, the last question that we'll cover today, how small a sample amount can I use? Uh, the sample amount will depend on how much heat that your sample produced and over how long time that heat is produced. That's one thing. So you need to have the heat production. And it also depends on the type of calorimeter you're using. Uh, the TAM has different type of calorimeters with different levels of sensitive, sensitivity. But if we just take an example again from the STANAG 4582. So the STANAG says at 60 degrees, the heat flow level uh, should not exceed 9.8 microwatt per gram sample over the time that you are measuring. If we now look at the calorimeter that's mostly used for the, the STANAG testing, the what we call the four milliliter mini calorimeter, that has a baseline level, a uh, baseline noise level of plus minus 100 nanowatts. So if we want to exceed this level in the amount of sample we put into the calorimeter, we in principle do not need to use more than 20 milligram of sample. Now uh, that will just take it up to the detection limit uh, for this um, level and the STANAG recommends that you fill the ampule up so that would be three grams of sample but for very energetic samples that you don't want to use too much of you can actually lower the sample amount quite a bit but you need to fill up the dead volume with some inert material to fill the the air space inside the ampules Okay, Malin. Well, thank you very much for the for the informative um, webinar as well as answering these these questions.
Um, for those of you have, who submitted questions that we did not get to, um, we will provide answers for all of your questions via email directly, uh, directly sent to you um, after this webinar. Um, also, if you would like additional information um, on the TAM or any other TA products, please go to www.tainstruments.com for more information or to submit um, any other questions that you may have or to set up a meeting with your local TA technical representative. Again, I, let, I would like to thank Malin for this uh, very informative webinar. Thank you.